Applying the art of toy making from creation to implementation is the very thing that makes our hobby possible. And while long time, established companies gave us a cast of figures representing characters across our favorite toy lines, modern developments and the growth of technology as well as online accessibility has given rise to widespread fan-made action figure products. The focus here will be on two fronts. The first will be expanding the range to fill existing character gaps across vintage toy lines, and the second will be showing natural derivatives of characters who perhaps didn't exist during those times but still fit well within our existing lineup of toys. Let's begin. This video is brought to you as part of Iconicon, an annual online five-day convention where content creators around the globe come together to bring you hours upon hours of pop culture entertainment. We hope you enjoy our list of panel discussion topics and specially produced Iconicon videos that will fill this exciting lineup of videos. Please visit IconiconOnline.com for information and check out the links in the description section below for an Iconicon playlist that I'll be linking to make sure you don't miss out on any of the fun. For the purpose of this video, I focused on figures within my own collection as well as items that I had immediate access to in photographic form. This by no means encompasses all or even the majority of what's out there in terms of fan-driven products. What that means is that I'll end up having to leave some names out, which is simply due to the limits of my own personal scope on this particular topic. I will also keep the discussion here primarily to products that fit nicely within the vintage range of action figures, as I feel that expanding the discussion into modern toys would be a separate upload altogether. But to be fair, I'll still touch on this topic ever so slightly. Furthermore, I'm also going to target the video towards smaller companies that release figures in somewhat sizable made-to-order batches, so I will have to omit single one-off customs that were done for an individual collector or customer. To kick things off, the 1978 to 1985 Star Wars lineup was known for the omission of characters across their original trilogy of films. And while I can't definitively know the reason why this was done, these omissions have paved the way for upstart companies to collectively fill gaps and enhance our displays to a highly noticeable level. I am aware that Hasbro's recent Kenner-style cardback retro collection gave us characters such as Grand Moff Tarkin and Snowspeeder Luke. And while I'm appreciative of having these figures and display them proudly among my collection, at least for now, it's apparent that the fan-driven companies are able to expand our selection on a wider level and at a more frequent pace of release. Now the first company that I became aware of in this context is Pro Custom Figures. One of their big strengths has been enhancing our character lineup for the original film's cast. In particular, the Rebel Fleet Troopers and Captain Antilles, who were in the opening minutes of the film, but resulted in a missed opportunity for Kenner at a time when the vintage figures were available on store shelves. Pro Customs has certainly capitalized on this opportunity. Similarly, Pro Customs offers several versions of the Sand Troopers who appeared on Tatooine, figures of which happen to display nicely with your vintage Kenner Stormtroopers. Also, as we get towards the later parts of the original film, the Pro Customs General Dodonna figure fits in nicely as leader of the Rebel Alliance, as do figures such as Biggs and Wedge, who fit nicely into any X-Wing pilot collection. And they've even developed their own, more accurate version of Luke Skywalker and other pilots to fit in with all of this. And looking past the first Star Wars film, I've also got this Pro Customs version of an L-slot rocket firing Boba Fett made to look like the uncolored prototype that we've seen go for exorbitant prices out there. And while this is technically considered a reproduction figure, I will point out that this item wouldn't ever be passed off as original, partly due to the PCF marking on the figure and the fact that purchased versions of a prototype rocket firing Boba Fett are to my knowledge, fully authenticated and usually sold with a lawyer present when transactions occur. One thing you'll note is that I put a bit of white tape on the weapons of my non-original figures. And I know it looks a little bit tacky, but this is largely because Kenner and Kenner stylized Star Wars figures are notorious for dropping their blasters, sometimes even at the slightest of touch. Thus, if I ever do drop a vintage blaster next to ones that were not made during the original figures era, I'll know which is which, so this is just my personal way of tangibly differentiating the accessories for my own purposes. 
In the same vein of vintage Kenner style Star Wars figures is Stan Solo Creations. Now, before I go into them as a company in detail, I'd like to point out that Stan Solo is the company behind this year's Iconicon exclusive Boba Fett figure, which was done up in the stunning Iconicon color scheme shown here. I'd like to send a thanks to Chris Smith for his passion and dedication, not just for bringing us more figures to enjoy for the hobby, but for his participation here to give us the opportunity to purchase an exclusive product for this special online convention. And if you happen to be on the fence about Stan Solo or other unofficial fan-made product for that matter, let me show you what they've got to offer. Among the several areas of strength for Stan Solo is where Chris has been able to expand the range for the Return of the Jedi cast. Among the most obvious is their Slave Leia figure, as well as this Ula figure, both of which are great additions for any Star Wars collection, and even more special for those who have any sort of Jabba the Hutt type of display setup. Also, for those who enjoyed the final Endor scene as much as I did in the Ewok Village, the Stan Solo Force Ghosts look great. With Obi-Wan being my favorite character and Yoda being a timeless presence in the Star Wars franchise, I grabbed these two to go with the last 17 Anakin that I already had, but admittedly Stan Solo has also done their own updated Force Ghost Anakin that aesthetically matches their Ghost Obi-Wan and Yoda figures a little bit better than the original one does. They've also got this great looking General Lando Calrissian figure with an attire scheme that's more akin to his on-screen Return of the Jedi appearance in the attack on the second Death Star. And while I expect people will always cherish their last 17 original Lando, I feel that this blue color scheme stands out more compared to the original figure. And while filling the Return of the Jedi gaps comes to mind for me most when I think of Stan Solo as a product, they do have a substantial general selection overall. For example, this Garandan or Long Snoot makes an excellent addition to any of the New Hope Tatooine displays, as does their ever popular and amazing looking Bantha, and of course, their wide selection of droids. Ultimately, there's no way for me to show every third-party Star Wars offering out there, but the ones that I have are able to help flesh out my humble-sized collection. Personally, I plan to buy more from both Pro Custom Figures as well as Stan Solo Creations, and I'm also interested in expanding the range with other excellent and reliable product that happens to be available. Similarly to Star Wars, the third-party G.I. Joe market in the 3 and 3 quarter inch range is not without its own provided reinforcements. Having said that, the availability of figures in the original line was quite plentiful back in the day, and we got nearly every character across the various forms of media available to showcase this toy line. I would say that the best known unofficial O-ring producer is Black Major. Now, I understand that Black Major has produced possibly hundreds of different deco schemes beyond what I'm about to show here, but this video is about giving an idea of what's available for you collectors out there to check out. One seemingly fitting idea to expand your range is this Snake Eyes figure done up to look like Deadpool in something of a crossover figure concept. Snake Eyes also naturally fits into Night Force simply due to his silent master type of nature, but also this Black Major figure has been done up to look like the other Night Force figures, at least in the 1988-89 color deco scheme. One could also venture into the various terrain themed figures such as this Snow Serpent colored snake eyes and timber, as well as an arctic version of the Night Viper. Note that when I am referring to snake eyes here, I know that in people's headcanon it could be snake eyes, but it could also be the Cobra Mortal or the Cobra Invasor that utilized the snake eyes mold in Argentina. For my own entertainment, I've also got a ninja of sorts protecting Serpentor, and whether you consider it a Storm Shadow turned to the Coil Faction to protect Serpentor, or if it's like any other Ninja Viper in your mind, either way, to me, this is a natural fit. And on the subject of the Coil, I'd also like to point out these snake armors that were done up by Black Major, as well as these fine Red Shadow snake armors, which were done up differently from the traditional Palatoy Escape armor sets back in the day. As for subteams, Starduster also fits quite nicely with these Tiger Force colors if you happen to be a fan of this grouping like I am. Now, a lesser known company that was often confused with Black Major is Red Laser's Army. So before I get into the repaints that further expand the range of characters, I'd like to point out the Argent 7 Red Lasers done up figures here of Manle, Red Mac, Topson, and Shimmick. 
If you're unfamiliar with these characters that were released in the original Plastirama Argentina G.I. Joe line, it's fine because I was unfamiliar with them initially as well. The original Argentina release of these characters are pricey even for wealthy collectors today, and as such, these figures are solid stand-ins to flesh out your ranks without spending the incredible large sums required to get each figure. I'll point out though that one differentiation with these red laser derivatives is that they are of the swivel arm design, and from what I can tell, their weapons are a little darker than that of the original G.I. Joe figures, and as such, they are not likely to be able to be passed off as original. As Red Laser was quite imaginative in their creation of product, I did do a video once on the green bicycle riding snake eyes, the artwork of which was seen on a 1982 bicycle frame bar pad, which became a figure that Red Laser released a number of years ago. They also released their own version of items that never made it to retail, such as both color schemes for Bombardier, who would have been part of the Action Force Special Weapons team if Palatoy had been given the chance to release another sub-team. I've done a video on both of these topics, so please check both of them out on my channel's back catalog if you get some free time. As for expanding your army builder options, Red Laser released some great battle android troopers, such as these Dreadnought type bats, to broaden the range of this iconic biker gang. They also released a Red Shadows themed bat, which is often referred to as a 2.0 version of the Mouton that the fans of the original Red Shadows will be familiar with. And on the subject of crossovers, they released both a Soundwave and Shockwave type of bat, which do a great job to pay homage to the respective Transformers Decepticon counterparts that both represent. They also released the bat in an Iron Grenadier color scheme, which is among my favorite releases by them, as well as the Cobra Trooper in this deco as well. Both of these products do a ton to expand the Iron Grenadier presence on any shelf. And as an aside, I've got these Red Lasers Terrodrome Security Vipers, who look great flanking the Commander, and are done up in the Terrodrome color scheme. Now going back to the Action Force theme here for a moment, Red Laser has also done some figures within the Hero sub-teams, such as their reimagining of the Zed Force Wheels character if the original had been done in an O-Ring design as opposed to the 5 POA, as well as Space Commander, i.e. the Space Force leader if he had been released as an O-Ring figure instead of being a 5 point of articulation figure as well. Red Laser has also been involved in some exclusives for fan-driven conventions, such as this previous 2019 Joe Lanta Overkill colored bat, as well as providing some figure parts that eventually resulted in being used for this retro Toy-Con exclusive of an evil Sergeant Slaughter. The use of sub-team based Steel Brigade figures was also another area of strength for Red Laser, and as such they did do some figures of Steel Brigade that fit within Tiger Force, Night Force, Sky Patrol, as well as the Action Force Z Force grouping. Again, this video would probably never end if I had more to show, but like with the Star Wars examples I gave, this is hopefully a good overview of what's out there. Sadly, Red Laser's army isn't making figures anymore, but their products seem to pop up on the secondary market and various social media outlets, so keep an eye on those if you see anything that strikes your fancy. And before I jump to the next toy line, I'll also point out this Once a Man Cobra Commander done by Matthew LaCroix, which is meant to represent the Commander in his gruesome mid-transformation sequence during the 1987 G.I. Joe animated film. However, these were cast in a home workshop type of manner from my understanding, and not done in a factory like the previous examples I mentioned, but pictures of these pop up on social media often enough that I thought it would be important to mention it here. Moving over to Generation 1 Transformers, this in theory could be another deep rabbit hole of a discussion, so I will narrow my focus to examples within my own collection. Okay, so around a decade ago, I got this RC by Impossible Toys, and I do believe it was initially intended for the modern line at the time of its release, but I do think it looks decent enough as a stand-in for a G1 collection given its scale and overall figure proportions. The figure transformation is also relatively simple compared to other modern figures, so it's kind of similar to original G1 figures in that fashion, and I realize the articulation is done closer to modern style, but as I got the War for Cybertron Kingdom RC figure from my own modern collection, I've moved the Impossible Toys version of this RC to the G1 shelf. 
I've also noticed that Impossible Toys either no longer exists as a company or stopped releasing figures altogether, so finding this exact version may be a bit of a hit or miss process for you, but Transformers have enough third party figures on the market that you can probably find a solid RC of your own choosing to stand in with your original collection if need be. Now for an existing figure enhancement option, if you're like me and thought that the original Ironhide and Ratchet figures looked a little bit silly, having made zero tooling modifications from their respective Diaclone predecessor figures, you might be interested to know that there's a few options out there for head upgrade kits. So the ones that I have here were made by a company called Best Toys, again another company that I haven't really heard about in the past number of years. But again, to give an idea of how third-party product can improve an overall figure's look, this is yet another example. I've seen other companies do versions of this with an enhanced head, shoulder, and arm scheme as well, if you prefer that instead. Now, it's probably a good thing that I chose to focus the discussion simply on items that were either made or could be reasonably shoehorned into vintage collections, as it narrows the scope of the discussion a bit more. But I would be remiss if I didn't at least briefly address third-party Transformers in more modern styles. For any fan of Masterpiece figures, there is a range of third-party companies, be it Fans Toys, MMC, Make Toys, Zeta Toys, DX9, and dozens of others that were made for the Masterpiece scale and size. And even as we go through my shelves here, you'll see that they fit nicely so that it's not obvious which ones were officially made by Hasbro or Takara and which ones were made by these third-party companies. But again, Masterpiece style offerings could probably be an altogether separate future upload. I will also give an honorable mention in that fashion to Valiverse, whose BotCon exclusive Wasp Raider looks great not only with my new Action Force setup, but with my Beast Wars setup as well as an alternative. The good thing here is that the Waspinator character it was based on is a character that I was never a fan of, but having done the Action Force Swarm Trooper in this color scheme fills that Waspinator void in my setup. The last company that I'll mention in detail is BAM Toyko and their options for filling out a vintage real Ghostbusters collection. Here we've got the Boogeyman, as well as Sam Hain, who were both memorable villains in some key real Ghostbusters cartoon episodes. I do know that Sam Hain was officially released in the Extreme Ghostbusters line after the original series concluded, but I feel that this Bam Toyko version does a better job in terms of the overall figure proportions. Bam Toyko also previously did an Egon Slab, which fits great to fill out any setup involving our main heroes. I've heard Bam Toyko is yet another company with more of a workshop type setup rather than a factory, but the fact that they've given us some iconic ghosts that we badly needed makes them more than worth a mention in this video. Again, I've likely missed a ton of fan-made products that could fill a vintage toy line. For example, I'm aware of the upscaled Battlestar Galactica ships that are out there, as well as recent Centurions figures that were meant to fill existing collection gaps. But that's why you guys are here. Since Iconicon is a far-reaching collaborative event, in that vein, I'd like to reach out to you as an audience to let me know in the comments section whose fan-made product you have bought in the past, as well as who you'd recommend for others to check out. I do kindly suggest that you keep your recommendations to first-hand experiences with product in your own collections, though, from reliable, trustworthy companies so that you can share your own personal experiences. With that, I'd like to thank the hosts of Iconicon, namely Analog Toys, who reached out to me to participate in this event, as well as Retro Blasting, a channel that has often told us that the fans are doing the best work, and hopefully videos like this one can help to accentuate this statement. Also thanks to my fellow presenters for Iconicon and all of you guys out there who have been watching this event. As mentioned previously, I'll link the Iconicon playlist to the description of this video so you can check out some work done by the other presenters. That's it for this video. Special thanks to my Patreon supporters whose names can be found in the description section of this video. Please visit patreon.com slash toy connections to check out some other perks and also if you're able to help this channel grow. Also please check out some other related toy content here. Subscribe to the channel if you already haven't, press that like button to spread this video to more viewers and share it with your friends. Otherwise, please enjoy the rest of Iconicon as we continue to cross the streams once again to bring you this fantastic pop culture experience. See you next time.